Well, hello again. It's Mrs. Coley. Yeah, I wanted to just talk to you today about a social studies topic on being a good citizen or having good citizenship skills. And it's, this is also going to be talking about some of our laws of our land and also agencies that are found in our communities that help us. And so anyways, uh, I hope that you listen up on this. This is very important to what makes you a great citizen. So to begin with, I'm gonna throw out some ideas of things that will make you a great citizen. If you volunteer in your community, if you're honest and trustworthy, if you follow the rules and laws, if you respect the rights of others, and you're informed about the world around you, you respect the property of others, you're compassionate, and you take responsibility for your actions. That makes you a good citizen. So hopefully you're trying to do those things. And now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what does it mean to be patriotic? Those are the two main topics that I'll be visiting with you about today. So what do you think it means to be patriotic? Does it mean that you just wear your red and blue, which you can see I'm sporting today, or that we look at our flag and we pledge our allegiance to the flag? Or does it mean that you like to celebrate on July 4th, our day of independence? What does that really mean? So give that a thought. So to be patriotic or to show patriotism, it means that you are proud of your nation and that you are attached to it as your homeland, meaning that you consider yourself a citizen or that this is your home in the United States. And so that makes you a patriotic person if you have that feeling of pride for your country. And hopefully you do. I know as we pledge our allegiance to our flag of the United States of America, um, we're, we're pledging our allegiance to our country. And then um, we're also talking about how we're honoring it. And we realize that we live in a nation with a republic, which is a type of government. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that too. And so as you pledge your allegiance, that's one way of showing patriotism also. So hopefully uh, as you pledge your allegiance each week at school or at different events that you go to, sports events or community events, when they have you pledge your allegiance, you stop and really think about the words that you're saying. Okay, so I'm going to take you on a trip back in time. I wish I had a little button you can push and then you were like in this time machine and you went back to 1776. But that's when a lot of our nation's history really changed for the best. So if you lived in the 1700s, it would be so different than it is today for many different reasons. But one of which is our government. Back in that day, we were not United States. We were called the New World, and we were governed by a king across the Atlantic Ocean by the name of King George III. And he ruled us, and we followed what his rules were, or what the laws of the land in Great Britain were. And so um, by the time these individuals here were part of our history, they realized that the kind of government or the kind of ruling that they had here in the new world, which was America, wasn't what they had envisioned. They were wanting more freedom. And so because of that, it did start a revolution. We were fighting for our rights because of taxation issues and because of the slavery issue. So slavery also was a key factor in that whole reason for why we fought for our revolution and to have our freedom from England. And so the next thing that happened when you create a new country is you have to think about what kind of a government do you want to create for your people? And so these individuals here that you can see on the screen, they each played a key role into what our government looked like. As you are aware, we all recognize the famous portrait of General George Washington or, or our first president of the United States, um, George Washington. We know that he had a key role in, in fighting our American Revolution battle. And without him, you never know what would have happened in history. We also know about Benjamin Franklin. He was an inventor. He was a scientist. He was a great writer. He was a great speaker. 
He was an ambassador to our country in France, but he also used his insights to help persuade individuals from the 13 colonies. There were 13 different, they looked like mini states, or they were little communities that um, were governed by some you know, leaders that were elected. And so they met also, and, and Benjamin Franklin was able to talk to them what he, he said would make a great country because he was familiar with different countries in Europe and, and how their government looked and the good things and the bad things. And so, yeah, we relied heavily on Benjamin Franklin, but also this person here is Thomas Jefferson. And he was later our third president of the United States. As we were developing, um, as we were trying to leave the rule of Great Britain, we had to let them know that we were done. And so we had to create a document that basically said that we were ready for our independence. And as you know, great second and third grade historians, that document was called the Declaration of Independence. And Thomas Jefferson, he was very scholarly, which means he read a lot of books. In fact, a lot of his library was used in one of the first national libraries. Um, he donated that. So we appreciate Thomas Je Jefferson for his knowledge also. And he was considered a great writer. And so John Adams asked Thomas Jefferson to write the revisions to our Declaration of Independence. It didn't take one time. As you know, if you're a writer, it starts by brainstorming and then you have your rough draft. And then from the rough draft, you're gonna make lots of revisions and you're gonna be editing some things, the grammar and the verb and the subject relationship and all those things that we practice at school. And that's what Thomas Jefferson did. He listened to what was being said and then he wrote it down in word form to what we have today. So we're grateful to him. And then we had all of the individuals meet together and they needed to sign the document. Um, this was, we declared our independence, as you know, on July 4th, 1776. That's when King George III in England was made aware that we were ready to be our own country. We didn't, we did not want to be part of them anymore. And so, there were individuals that were meeting together in each of the colonies. They declared their independence from, from England or Britain, and they had to sign their names on a document called the Declaration of Independence. Let me show you what that looks like. Just here it is. And one of the things that the document does mention is that it says that we, the people, and it goes on to say that all men are created equal. And we hear a lot of uh, people in the future that go back to that original terminology, people like Martin Luther King Jr. talks about equality and other great leaders also go back to our original declaration that made us different for, from the country that was ruling us. We wanted to develop a country that was created for equality and so that everybody had equal rights. And in this Declaration of Independence, some of the unique wording, if you were to go on and read that, it says that all men were, they were created to have certain God-given rights, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And again, I had mentioned that um, it was signed by an individual by the name of John Hancock first. And this was at the Continental Congress. And he signed his name really long, really large. So if you were to look at the actual document of the Declaration of Independence, you'll see one signature that kind of jumps out at you uh, more so than the other signatures. And that's because he was the president of that meeting. And when he signed his name on July 4th, 1776, he wanted to make sure that King George III didn't have to wear his glasses. And just know that uh, by the time all of the delegates and the representatives from the original 13 colonies um, got the document to sign. It, it took until August. But when each one of those individuals signed that document, they were pretty much signing their life away. So if the American Revolution didn't go as planned or a battle against England, they knew that they would be considered a traitor of the king and they were the first they would be the first ones to be found and i guess 
judged and at some point probably they would lose their lives. And so they knew that it was a death sentence when they signed on on that document, but they were willing to do that because they were good citizens and they knew that a good citizen fights for what they believe in. Later, after we won our battle against England and we did truly gain our independence and we were a free country, what we had to consider next was, is what was our government gonna look like? Because we were a new country and all we could do was look to the other countries and see how they formed their governments and what governments were more successful than others. Why would you wanna create a new country and have a government system that, that wasn't for the people? And so a lot of thought went into what kind of a government should we create? And that's what the Constitution is. The Constitution has a lot of amendments. It's been amended, like there's 27 amendments. And so it continues to change. But the, the purpose of the Constitution is to pr provide, I've got some notes here. It provides the, the supreme laws of the United States of America. And back at the Constitutional Convention, that's when this Constitution was being formulated. It was back, it was actually finished in seven, on 17, September 17th, 1787. So you can see that it took a while before uh, the representatives from the different colonies, which became states, before they came up with, you know, how should we run our government? Because it wasn't something they just wanted to jump into. They really wanted to give it a lot of thought. And they knew that their government, it, they wanted to make sure that it would have the three branches of government. It didn't just want to have a king. They were tired of having a king rule as a monarchy where one king decides everything. And so they really put some thought into this and they realized they wanted to have a federal branch. They wanted to have a federal level and then a state level. And the federal level would have three branches and the state level would have three branches. And so you can see here, the US Constitution requires that we have a republic where supreme power is held by the people and their elected representation or like mayors, senators, legislative, le legislators. And we also have an elected president. And one of the things you have to be aware of, which makes our country wonderful, is that when people are elected to these different state positions or federal positions as representatives, they're, they're elected for a term. A term generally is for, so one term usually equals four years. And if you're a president of the United States, they, they have to be reelected and it doesn't just roll over. And do you know how many times that a president can be elected or serve? a term? Let's see if you know. How many terms can they be in office? You're right, two terms. Do your math. So how many years can we have a president be elected as our president of the United States? Did you say eight years? You're right, because four plus four equals eight. So nice. You, it sounds like you boys and girls have been learning a little bit about the election process and a little bit about um, kind of the rules and regulations of being elected to an office. So what I want you to look at really quickly would be the three branches of government. You can see here the word executive. The executive branch is where our president of the United States is. If we were looking at a federal level, that's where our president of the United States would. He also has a vice president. And if we were looking at a state level, they also have, and he would live at he would be at the White House. But at a state level, we would also have the exec executive branch, but we would have our governor. So it looked just a little bit different. And then um, as you go from state to county and city and those kind of things, then you have your mayors, but you do have someone that is in charge, but they don't get to make all the decisions because it has to be balanced. So the nice thing about our government is we have checks and balances. We can write laws, but they have to be um, they have to be approved. Or they get vetoed, then they have to go back and be worked on again. 
We also have in our federal level, we have the legislative branch and that's at the US Capitol and that's where your Congress members meet and to, to talk about laws and, and those kind of things. But we also have a judicial level and that's where your Supreme Court meets and they talk about the laws of the land also and, and writing laws and looking at if they're constitutional, they go along with our constitution and those kind of things are, are looked at here. That would be your Supreme Court. So just know we have it on a federal level. This is more federal. And then it also goes to a state level. I don't know if you've ever gone on a field trip to maybe the state capitol, but that's where we have these different bodies there at our state capitol. And then also to your city level where you have your city offices, where your mayor is, and that individual is elected too. So it's nice to know that we, we definitely are in good hands with our government and that when we do pay taxes, it's going to help support our nation, to help support education. It helps to support transportation so that we can drive our cars down roads and for these elected officials that do represent us. And so it's nice to know that we as a people get to choose who we elect. That's the importance of voting. And as a side note, I know that I had mentioned in one of my lessons I was talking about citizenship and I was talking about an incredible person by the name of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who lived in the 1800s and she fought for equal rights in regards to voting. And I was guessing as far as when um, that became an amendment and I was correct, it was in 1920 and it was, this makes it easy. It was the amendment in our constitution that is the 19th amendment. So that's good to know. So people can make a difference. And the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, and other teachers will talk more about this in greater detail, is what is our Bill of Rights? And uh, that actually came into effect on December the 15th in 1791. So you can see that our government continues to make improvements and the laws of the land are, are um, are being considered and improved. And one of the nice things about the Bill of Rights, it was overseen by James Madison and it has amendments to the constitution. And so as of right now, it's it's the first 10 amendments from our constitution. They were revised a little bit and made into the Bill of Rights. So you can actually go through those and see what what the laws of the land are and what your rights are as a citizen of the United States of America, which is wonderful. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about was if you have an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C., which is Washington, the District of Columbia, not the state of Washington, but you can actually go to the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., and yes, I've been there. It is outstanding. And while you're there, you get to see three very important documents. And they're the ones I just talked about just a few minutes ago. You get to see the original Declaration of Independence. You get to see the original Constitution of the United States of America. And you all get, also get to see the Bill of Rights, the, the original document from those dates that I shared with you a few minutes ago. And they're housed in such a way that they are put in they're, they're available to go see for public viewing, but they're in a bronze framed bulletproof glass container. And at night, what's interesting is these containers, it looks like kind of a podium and you can go and they only have a certain number of people go up to each of the different documents and these container areas and you can view it and then you can walk to the other area and then they don't let a whole bunch of people go in at one time because they want to control it. And there's a lot of military people that are watching those documents because they're kind of like our prized possession as a country. You know, that's where our freedoms came from. And at, at nighttime, those containers are actually lowered, lowered into a vault in the basement area of that building to keep them safe and secure. So just know that it's great to have pride in your country. It's, it's okay to wear red, white, and blue on July 4th and enjoy the fireworks and say the Pledge of Allegiance with 
enthusiasm and with patriotic pride because it's okay to love our country and we should be especially conscientious and grateful as we talk about how can we be thankful. We need to be thankful for all of those wonderful Americans that make up our military forces that are willing to lose their lives for our great country. So today I'm going to give a great big shout out and a big hug to all of all, all of your parents who who protect me and my freedoms as a you know as a military person in the army, navy, air force, marines, national guard and all of those different agencies that are included with our government system. So I am so grateful to be a benefactor of all of these great things that we have here in the United States of America. And I hope you are too. Well, enjoy the rest of these upcoming lessons. You're going to learn so much and your patriotism is only going to grow that much more. So until next time, have a great day and keep on smiling.